The Unshackled Waves, Episode 39. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for another interview show. Our guest for today is Australian YouTuber Adrian from the channel Life, Love and Anarchy, who produces videos about f- the philosophy of anarcho-capitalism. The, his videos explore historical events, debates with those who hold different philosophies, and also videos exploring the philosophies of uh, popular cultural phenomenon. So I thought we'd invite him onto the show today to discuss narco-capitalism, his aims with these videos, and debate some areas where we might differ. differ. So Adrian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. It was a very nice intro. Happy to be here. So you identify as a narco-capitalist. Now, I have uh, somewhat sympathy with anarcho-capitalism. I still consider myself uh, a libertarian. I would like to reduce the state as much as possible, but I always believe that uh, completely getting rid of it is probably a bit unattainable. Uh, so how did you become uh, come to your position? I mean, what was your political journey? My political journey was a pretty uh, apolitical up until the um, GFC happened. And I remember when it happened, um, there was a big arguments online about who, what happened and who's to blame. And I found both sides had really compelling arguments, and I made the decision just to uh, follow through and make my own choice. And I figured, well, in order to understand GFC, I have to understand econo- economics. So I read a lot of classical literature on economics, like Adam Smith, Henry Hazlick, um, Henry Bastrick. And I found there's a whole resource out there about economics especially free market economics that has moved into contemporary fields with Tom Woods and Ron Paul and the newer generations. And they've actually explained it, what actually happened. And they go all the way back to like how money is produced. And I, and I found out that free markets generally is the way to go through my economic theory. That was then. And then when I I discovered about these ideas, I've discovered there's whole different elements and levels to it as well, such as metaphysics and objectivism, Ayn Rand and Rothbard and Mises. And there's also a very big community online representing like Stefan Molyneux's work, Mises Institute work. And just from there, that was like eight years ago, through um, logical working out debates, I found out that Anarcho-capitalism is was right and the proper way to run society. I think. Yeah, it sounds like you were, your journey was more an intellectual journey. I'd always been of the opinion that get yeah, free free markets had always been the best to bring about wealth and uh, better development in the West. But it was only until a bit later on when I started to get into the ph- philosophers of it and the economists such as Rothbard, uh, Friedman and obviously uh, Ayn Rand. Uh, you also uh, run your own business. Uh, does that experience, uh, experience running, a biz- running a business, being in enterprise in the free market, has that uh, shaped, your, shaped your view as well? Uh, no, not really. I was, I was starting my own business before I, I, was, I was still uh, apolitical. It's just, I, I just found it to be uh, something I wanted to do, start my own business, and I was interested in entrepreneurship. But uh, during that, I noticed there's a lot of narrative from the left that blames every, every issue on the world on capitalists, on business owners, which I always felt was unfair and unjustified. It's only um, later did I find out that we are scapegoated for everything um, from the left. But so no, my um, business experience came before my um, political journey. I notice in a lot of your videos when you're debating uh, communists or socialists or whatever they they call themselves, uh, that their their line of argument is is always that the workers are always exploited by the the businessmen. It's a very hard sort of uh, stereotype to break down that you know the the businessman he's actually the one working the hardest you know mm. trying trying to trying to make the business profitable serving serving the customer making sure that he can always do the best. Yeah, that's true. It just comes from just general Marxist crap. Just, just the uh, because they wanted to attack the capitalists. It's their wealth they want to expropriate, so they have to make him the bad guy. And the most 
cleverest way they can think of that is, well, you, they don't pay them the complete wage that they're worth, even though they don't know what they're worth and how business works. So therefore, let's take their shit. And that's that's just Marxist theory in a nutshell. So yeah, I don't really appreciate that kind of narrative. And they have to use that because otherwise the, we're not immoral, basically. I, I'm always of the opinion because they have... Uh, because they always say that you would say that since you're a businessman, but uh, my job is just at the uh, local supermarket here, and I always say that you know that that job is easy because I just go there, uh, you know, do a low skilled job, get my paycheck. I mean, I, pre I pretty much don't have to uh, put in put in much effort, and so mm. I don't feel that I'm being exploited. I feel that I'm pretty getting a pretty good deal. Yeah, I felt the same way too when I was working at supermarkets doing um, night fills. And that narrative was a long, uh, I was exposed to that narrative when I was working there as well. And I never really accepted it or absorbed it. I always felt like it was just a bunch of bullcrap. And going back to, obviously, your political journey, a lot of people, especially in the last decade, were um, inspired by Ron Paul and, and also, and also <laughs> trying to find an explanation for the financial crisis. And so that's when I really think that or libertarianism or anarcho-capitalism really uh, became quite relevant and, and reached mm. a lot of people. Do you think that that was when it was at its most relevant and why there was suddenly this uh, re revolution, as, it, as it's called? Um, I definitely think there's a lot of culture elements in that movement of Ron Paul because he was he was the only person who libertarian who was from memory speaking as from a constitutionist point of view, which really appeals to a lot of Americans. But the ideas he's talking about are timeless. It's it's not just Americans that like believe in the idea of limited limited government. It's a very European Western paradigm, and it's great that he attracted a lot of people to that message and taught a lot of people about Austrian economics back then. But once he failed to get in, that movement dispersed. And I think it's it's gathered around Trump. Those people have, have moved towards the Trump. Yeah, after his uh, well, 2012 campaign, his, his second presidential run, that's when the, well, the, the grand coalition that he put together really uh, dispersed. Uh, so it was obviously you had the the more uh, religious uh, liberty people. They went to Ted Cruz. Uh, mm. the, uh, the left uh, libertarians they went to Gary Johnson, and then the uh, the more patriot-minded people went to Trump. Um, mm. Now Trump is probably uh, the phenomena of the rise of Trump. Sort of represents uh, where the big split came in the uh, anarcho-capitalist libertarian community. Um, mm. Uh, basically over the, the current cultural crisis in the West and over open borders and Islam. So sort of, uh, 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 I experienced this firsthand in 2016, 2016. There was the left libertarians who thought that, you know, Trump and this cultural battle were the worst things uh, uh, possible for liberty, while there were people like us who, sat, who saw that the left was pretty much out of, out of control um, with social justice warriors running around at universities on the street, the rise of identity politics saying that, you know, we're all racist and bigoted or whatever, and there's the, the, the patriarchy. Uh, so uh, what do you make of, of, of this split in, in, the, in the coalition that, that was once together? Is it, is it a bad thing or is it, is it just, a, just a fact that it happened? I don't know how to answer that. I think um, I think it's I, I support Trump because it's it's pra pragmatic too. That there isn't really an option. It's either it was either Hillary or Trump. Now, there wasn't a very hard ANCAP uh, candidate. So it, from pragmatic reasons, I had to support Trump. And Trump is not like I consider him like a, a common people. He doesn't really have a, a role in politics. Now the reason why I think a lot of liberty-minded people didn't don't support Trump, I, I don't really I really I really don't know I really can't answer that I think a lot of it comes from culture and biology not so much him as a well, not so much his policy positions I, I really can't explain it There's a definitely a, a divide, but for an ANCAP to support Hillary over Trump I can't rationally explain that. 
although I can explain a more hardline anti-status view, ultimately taking that position over Trump, but you can, you, there's not going to be a liberty movement or a possibility of liberty in America if Hillary would have gotten in. Oh yeah, definitely not. I mean, I supported Trump because he was the best on what were the key issues of 2016, which was immigration and fighting political correctness and uh, a culture of free speech. I mean, he was the best on what I thought were the most important issues of that time. And like, yes, he wasn't good on obviously free trade, for example, and the NSA, for example, but those were... I think in 2016, relatively minor issues compared to what what was happening in the world. Yeah, I agree, and I think it's 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 sad that it's come to that. I would have thought immigration would be a, a non-debatable issue, just seeing what's going on in Europe and what's happening to the demographics in America. But I take on the position that the Democrats and the left are embracing open borders because they need more of their kind in America to overpopulate and out democratically vote right-wing policies and pro-white policies? Well, I think it's because they have a utopian view on the world. They want to, uh, they believe that, you know, we, everyone can just get along, we can just, you know, hold hands and, and we'll have world peace. They don't, they don't seem to understand that there's... No, they don't um, believe that. They don't, they don't share that hospitality to um, Nazis or alt-right or capitalists. If they're for people that believe in the same thing they believe in. Oh, I'm, say, I'm saying that, yeah, obvi obviously that uh, they believe that there are enemies in the world, but the reason they embrace this open border stuff is because uh, they believe that, you know, that's, that, that's the key to uh, uniting, uniting the world. I mean, they want one world, everyone being the same. Well, if that was true, they would like their political enemies and open the borders to them, but they don't, they don't do that. Uh, that, uh, that is an interesting point, but uh, I, cer I certainly think, well, you are right in that it seems to be only white people who are considered the enemy and that they're tolerant of all the, all the different uh, barbaric views of the non-white people. But it's definitely, like, if you, if you meet sort of irrational uh, leftists, they, they do hold this uh, utopian view of the world that... Uh, we we can all get along with differences, but yes, there is that flaw in their in their argument that you know they want people to get along with their differences, except these kind of differences. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So I think that takes preferences over their view of utopian with everyone, because that might be the narrative that they use, but their own lifestyle doesn't support that narrative. Mm. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mean to say it was completely coherent. Obviously, it's not. <laughs> well, nothing they say is ever coherent. It's like trying to work out what the left really mean is just like an exercise in futility. Yeah. You were, you were correctly pointing out the flaws then. I was, I was going, wait, yeah, you're right. This doesn't make sense. I come from a more red pill point of view where I don't think there's a, an ever a, a possibility where we can achieve peace or understanding with the left. And the only conclusions we have is like, we live in there and they live over here and we have our own different nation and government and they have theirs. I definitely think outreach to the left is, is pointless. And this is what I really didn't like about uh, the, the libertarian movement is that they tried to, tried to make libertarianism cool to the left. Oh, you know, we care about these social justice issues. You know, we care about minorities and all, all these different people. And, uh, but our only difference is that, you know, we think that the free market is good. And they'd always say, look, look how good Uber is, or oh, Airbnb, oh, you know, look, look at how nice everything is. Like, why won't, why won't you come with us? Like, aren't you sold on this? Well, in a sense, that worked. Libertarian, there's a lot of leftists in the libertarian movement now, so much so that libertarianism has lost a lot of its meaning. Well, it's, uh, they definitely pick the, the wrong side of the, the cultural uh, battle to be upon uh, because uh, basically the, the inner city uh, people, the, the cultural elites and the media, they're a very small percentage of the population. And so if you're spending all your energy getting, you know, people in the universities and in the media uh, and the arts to like you, I mean, that's completely neglecting pretty much the, the large majority of the rest of the population. Well, that was the case uh, 
15 years ago, but all, all, all those people in universities have, no, have now grown up and have taken positions in the media and in government and a lot of the important um, positions to further continue the Marxist narrative. I, I consider myself, um, like I've said, I said, it, said at the start, I'm a libertarian, but I probably consider myself mainly a paleo libertarian. I, I believe that if we want libertarianism, we've got to make it appeal to the working class and the masses, le uh, you know, learn what, what they want in life, and then, uh, and then pitch the, the libertarian message to them. So stress the importance of you know, family, private property, uh, having, a, having a job, you know, being able to buy a home, you know, raising families in peace, uh, mm. ra rather than focusing on what, what seems to matter to these inner city people, which is you know, the, uh, so, social justice issues, uh, feminism, you know, LGBT, whatever. Right. Well, from what I'm from what I've seen from um, the mainstream Australian media, at least, we're not winning that battle. Everything, everywhere I look, is catered to the inner city demographics. Well, well, that's what you and me are trying to change. I mean, the we, we've seen the mainstream media um, pretty much in 2016 collapse. I mean, they all supported Hillary Clinton, yet she still lost. And we saw the rise of the alternative media, which was mm. able to uh, get, get the truth out there to the American people. And I think that's what won Trump the election. But yes, we, we haven't seen that here in Australia yet. I mean, that's why I started the, the Unshackled, because I saw that there was, uh, that was missing in Australia. Yeah, good on you. I hope, the, hope it's a big success. Yeah, oh, well, we've got positive feedback so far, so we're inspired to uh, keep going. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Now, uh, I often get this from other libertarians. They argue that um, uh, we ca uh, people like us, we can't call ourselves libertarians or narco-capitalists because we support nationalist movements, and they say that they're inherently statists. Uh, so what's your response to these accusations? I don't think uh, nationalism is inherently status. I think nationalism comes under two, two concepts, the concept of ethnicity and the concept of c culture, national culture. So you can be Russian and live under Tsar rule, live under Soviet rule, and now live under Putin rule, but national, nationalized, you're still Russian, you still have Russian blood, and you still believe in Russian culture. I think politics something that's placed above nationalism and you can embrace nationalism without embracing a, a, a brand of politics that goes with it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a convincing argument because the fact if you look at, for example, the Middle East, I mean the, the national boundaries that are drawn are completely different from the, the cultural and ethnic uh, boundaries in that, in, in that area. And religion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, nationality, uh, sorry, nationalism is important to draw from, from when you're trying to um, argue or appeal to culture or ethnicity. So when it comes to immigration politics, uh, policies, nationalism is a very strong value to draw from. Well, identity is important. I mean, people want to feel that they're part of a community. I mean, yes, we're in individualists and voluntarists, but also people, they, they need you know, other people to, you know, obviously to trade with and, you know, collaborate with and, and be around. And so certainly they want to be with people whose values and cultures and traditions are the same as theirs. Right, yeah. And that's what we see in Australia. Like, uh, it's a multicultural community, but the cultures in Australia are segmented into different suburbs. So each suburb is a different culture and a different ethnicity group. And even in a completely anarcho-capitalist society, there'd be some sort of a community governance structure. It would be would be voluntary, uh, but it would still uh, there there would still be a a for a form of community. Yes, exactly. And I think uh, these forms of communities that which might be just based on industry or gender or nationality or culture will take the position of looking after the individuals in those groups and serve the role of what the state is supposed to do. Yeah, definitely. Now let's talk a bit about your um, channel. Now it sticks to solely philosophical matters and your videos are also uh, quite long as well. 
And this is uh, up ho uh, quite different from many of the other right-wing or, as I call them, anti-social justice warrior channels, which tend to <laughs> stick to current events. They have shorter videos and design to, to entertain. So those channels tend to be more popular uh, because their content is easily digestible. You only need to watch five minutes and you're already across an issue. So why did you decide to create a YouTube channel uh, in, in this, the format that you have? Because I think um, the topics I talk about deserve to be talked about in, in depth. And um, it's my, it matches my skills as well. I have a filmmaking background and advertising background. And my aim is to create emotional, engaging presentations that deals with everything the topic can deal with. So I don't like to leave important things out. And when you're talking about big issues, such as, uh, I don't know, the um, Spanish Civil War or... The Jewish question, it takes a very long time to explain these things because I like to give the topics the, res the respect it deserves. Yeah, uh, cer certainly your videos are very informative and uh, there, were, there was a lot of, when I watched your videos in preparation for this show, there was a lot that I learned about, it, especially about the, the Spanish uh, Civil War. Um, so do you, but like I said, there's sort of your format, it doesn't reach as many people. Do you still think that that's, you're, you're making a difference? Well, yeah, I've, I've done some good views, I think, if they've, they've passed my expectations. But um, I'm not good at doing the um, anti-social justice stuff. It, it, that People who are content creators do that because that's what they're good with. And it also takes a very quickly, uh, not a long time to do a lot of these short videos. But again, I like to make things of art almost, like presentations that are timeless, that appeals to a wide audience and to talk about these topics at length, which means they're much longer, but it also means that I demand the attention of audience more. So I think it appeals to the people I want to target, while the people who are short-minded are not, or narrow-minded are not really interested in uh, investing that time in watching my videos, which is just sits me fine. Yeah, I suppose that's fair enough. I mean, you want you want to create something which you believe has value, and if people are seeking, searching through YouTube for for that sort of content, they come across you. I mean, all your facts are there. It's presented in a very good manner. Um, they're, then uh, they're much more able to be convinced by your point of view. Right, and I've seen a lot of um, YouTubers use the arguments I bring up or the history lessons I bring up in their arguments, which is, and they're and they changing the narrative on YouTube, which is really wanted what I wanted to do. Uh, so you, you don't have anything against what the, the anti-social justice warrior YouTubers do? No, I'm a big fan of a lot of them. I think they're hilarious, and uh, I don't want to discourage any of that, and I want to keep them going. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I definitely think that's the right attitude. I mean, yeah, people are uh, good at good at different things. I try to what we at the Unshackled try to do is have a blend of yes, we have easily digestible articles and media, but then we also try to mix that in with more deeper philosophical articles as well. Yeah, I think it's the way of go. It appeals to a wider audience that way. Mm. We can't all do response videos to Riley Dennis <laughs> or Milo Stewart all the time. <laughs> oh, we could. <laughs> Nothing actually, stopping us, really. I actually came across a channel which was basically just response videos to them. Uh, I think I think they have a lot of fun, and I think a, a lot of people have, like watching it because um, a lot of these people as well. There's there's a lot of them, people on the left that do. What I want to encourage from YouTube is people to having a dialogue, but. Those they're almost caricatures, where Riley and all that, they don't have dialogues. They, they always want to be in their own secluded echo chambers and talk to people who already agree with them. And when they shut themselves off, they just encourage people to make these kind of response videos, which must damage their self-esteem, mm -hmm. which is uh, almost a shame, but like, deserving as well. Now, you mentioned um, about echo chambers there. Now, you like to get out of uh, your echo chamber, and a lot of your videos are debating uh, communists, uh, socialists, and other adherents of totalitarian philosophies. Um, although it's important mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, uh, to debate these people as it helps us uh, 
be more sure in our beliefs and fine tunes our debating skills. But sort of how I see it is, and this is why sort of I avoid Facebook arguments, which last for hours and hours again, is that you're never going to convince these people. Um, so do you? Uh, so do you still believe that like these debates, like even though obviously you're not going to agree, they're still a worthwhile contribution? I think there's always a possibility that these pipe people might accept reason, but uh, it's, it's, I always accept that as a possibility. I don't want to uh, completely shut, uh, just ignore that. But uh, if I didn't have my YouTube channel, I wouldn't be wasting my time. The point is to um, see, open the um, debate to the audience and see what, what the um, point of view from both perspectives and also how easy it is to debate because uh, I don't really... Um, use intellectual historical data points often. I usually just use this Soc the Soc Socrates? So Socrates? What's his name? How do I pronounce it? So so Socrates. So Socrates line of reasoning. or It's just like trying to um, cross-examine their principles and ask questions and see the contradictory points that they have. And when you're dealing with the left, it's not that hard to find. And they usually just get emotional and tr triggered from that, and I find that fun and entertaining. But I I want to... Um, the point is that, that this left, the communists, they're arguing for a, a violent revolution, and in a violent revolution, they target people like you and me, people on the right, as well as capitalists. So I really want to uh, demonstrate for the audience that these people are really just thugs and criminals and um, are dangerous which is why I have these conversations on my YouTube channel. Now, um, I don't. I accept that the more hardcore communists, it's almost like it's in their blood and I won't change their minds, but I think showing that off and lighting up how they think and what their behaviors are uh, demonstrates to people that this is like almost a life and death struggle at times. Yeah, I definitely think that... Uh, obviously, having a, a YouTube debate is probably a lot more constructive than, say, a private a Facebook debate because m most of the time, these socialists and communists, it's pretty easy to make them embarrass themselves and contradict themselves and uh, uh, project a whole bunch of fallacies. Right, yes. How do you sort of uh, meet, uh, meet up with these people? Like, how do, how do you get them to agree to be on your channel and sort of what's your relationship like with them? Uh, I think most of them know who I am now, now on YouTube. I've been, I've been trying, when I started out, I was trying really hard to get some of the well-known leftist YouTubers to appear on my channel, but they're just not interested. They just just block me, and they, they don't want to... I think it's due to the echo chamber. Um, it was easier to bring some of the people on because they didn't. I didn't think they know who I was. Yeah, sort of they're really... More, uh more successful uh, leftist YouTubers, they, they wouldn't want to put themselves in a position where they're likely to be humiliated. But sort of, obviously, the, the ones who are less well-known would be more likely to sort of, oh, this is how I'm going to make a big name for myself. Which is a shame, really, because, like, they do, like, the, some of the well-known leftist YouTubers do kind of branch out to other people that are not well-known. But even people who are not well-known, who know how to think critically, use the same Socratic reasoning and they always just fall apart. So I, I think they um, are dedicated and focused on just sticking with their own kind and staying with their own echo chamber. Now, I agree with you that uh, because a, a lot of a lot of the people you debate, they call it, like some of their names, they call their libertarian socialist or anarcho communists, and I, I certainly agree. How can they call themselves uh, anarchists? And it seems like the term anarchist has been quite corrupted by the left, because I see it used by a lot of conservatives as a slur against the left. So, sort of, how do you think we can rec reclaim the term anarchist and make it a positive word again? I don't think it can. I don't think we can. I think um, anarchy used to be Greek to mean no rules, but it was been left. I think the left have co-opted that term fairly with Pro Proudhon or Prohorn during the French Revolution. I think he was the first one to call himself an anarchist. The way I get around with that is uh, just calling ourselves anarcho-capitalists because everything is there in the name. So we, we believe in no state in anarchy, but we also believe in anarchism. Uh, sorry, capitalism, the private ownership of the means of production. So there's no um, confusion there. So I think anarchy is a lost cause, although 
I, I like to use the word anarchy wherever I can just to you know, take just try to get that word back to the Greek roots. But uh, anarcho-capitalism should be the like the defining word. Yeah. The left, they have corrupted a lot, a lot of words over the years, but I just, yeah, it just amazes me how they can get away with, I mean, the term anarchy is, is meant to, nobody can force you to do anything. I mean, there are no rules, but the thing about communism is that it forces you to share everything and perform a certain task. I mean, it's the, the most involuntary for, form of uh, for, system of living that you can possibly think of. Yeah, absolutely. That's what the left does. They they co-opt terms. They're just basically sophists and Kantian ethics. They just uh, steal terms and co-opt it in order to gain support, which they did with the term anarchy, which they did the term liberalism. We have to call it classical liberalism now because liberalism means progressive now. And then what they've done to libertarianism. Libertarianism used to mean Rothbardian, classical liberal, oh, Rothbard yes. kind of stuff. Yes. Now, it's, now it's their word. So oh. I don't see them succeeding if we use the term anarcho-capitalism. Oh, yeah, def definitely. I mean, libertarianism is the next word that they're try are trying to corrupt. Mm. I mean, that's why I like to use the word paleo libertarianism. Who knows, the left might even distort the term alt-right next. You never know. Yeah, I think they're trying to alt-left. I think they're trying to make that a thing. Oh, uh, that, that's not, uh, not too bad. I mean, it's got the word left in it, so they're, they're, they're not lying. <laughs> Now, one of the, the key tenets of uh, anarcho-capitalist theory is the non-aggression principle. Now, I've heard you in your videos saying that this uh, uh, principle does not apply to communists. Now, I've heard <laughs> um, this argument from uh, anarchists such as Christopher Cantwell. I listened to his show. Uh, so he, he obviously believes that you can throw communists out of helicopters. He's a big fan of that. Uh, and also, he argues that the left has just become so violent and so extreme that to counter it, you have to be violent and violate the non-aggression principle. I mean, can, can violence against communists be justified? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's completely valid. Non-aggression principle is supposed to be used to identify the bad guys. So we have a property, and uh, we no one's supposed to violate that property right, private property right. And... Uh, that's a non-aggression principle. Now, communists don't believe in that. They believe private property rights is theft or inherently wrong, and they're justified in using force and violence to remove that private property right, which means using militia to invade and um, stay in factories and private means of production. Now, that's a inherently violating the non-aggression principle, so I, I, we're justified in throwing them out of helicopters as far as I'm concerned. But isn't it a form of pre-crime? I mean, yes, they have these beliefs in that they believe in, in force, uh, forcing people to hand over their money and their property, but the thing is they, they haven't done it yet, and so how can, how can you justify in, uh, pre-emptive uh, pre, <coughs> pre action against them? Well, when... Is it the appropriate time when they start the revolution? Well, yeah, when, when, they, when they steal people's property and steal people's money. Well, usually when they do that, it's because they're sure they can win. So that happened in Soviet Russia and that happened in Spain because the militia were armed and could get away with their doing the red terror campaigns. Now, if we establish a libertarian socialist order, people who are, who are actively promoting communism ideas should be removed from that society. And I don't think that's a, that's a big, um, that's a breach of a non-aggression principle. You don't think it violates uh, freedom or the rule of law or liberty? Sorry, that's that they don't believe in that. Uh, doesn't that, the, the fact that you're, you're taking action against people for holding ideas, uh, isn't, isn't that a suppression of free speech? Well, no, because it's not just an idea. It's an idea that has historically real roots that promotes violence and the end of that libertarian social order. I mean, if they're not happy with living in a libertarian social order, I don't want to understand why they just don't leave or work around it or start their own communes. Why are they? Because they always seem to be focused on taking other people's stuff. So that, that goes against private property rights and a non-aggression principle. 
Uh, I do, yeah, I do agree that if communists ever got into power, it would be uh, disastrous for our civilization. But yeah, I can't, I can't get on board with yeah. Let's just throw them out of helicopters and and physically. I'll, I'll give you a few years. It doesn't take much. It's like once you start talking to these people and just see how shallowly evil they are, it's it's like it's not it's. They're not even the same people, basically. Yeah, I, I certainly understand your frustration and <laughs> with them, but I, I always take the, the point of view that we still have to take the, the moral high ground, even though we're surrounded by you know, people who have these horrible ideas, we've sort of still got to be the, the better person. I think uh, that that point of view will get us killed. Being like, because um, a lot of people do take the moral high ground. The, the fact is, they don't take the moral high ground, and they and they use that weakness in us to use it against us. Yeah, like you said, maybe maybe I, they just need to wear me down a bit more. <laughs> It'll happen. We'll see how. What you do a few years of unshackled if you get popular and you get all these um, death threats for being successful? I think you might change your mind. Well, I haven't got many death threats yet, so yeah, that's a bit disappointing. <laughs> now, your videos, they go into a lot of detail about um, history, and, and that can tell us a lot about modern political developments. Um, so why is history, and obviously by history I mean like real history, proper history, not what you see on the History Channel, uh, why is it so neglected by people with similar views to us? Because it's hard. It's hard to um, read about history. Even when I when I did my JQ question, everything, um, the most time-consuming part of that was researching because uh, if you ever look on Wiki, they leave a lot of important details out on purpose. So it's it's hard to dig up the facts and look into real history and see both sides of it because it's it's really dug in and hard to find. And a lot of these history lessons sometimes just come out of like news clippings and a media journalist. So I, I think people don't talk about it because it's hard to talk about. And the people who are specialized in history, they, um, the most you can find is like maybe a podcast where someone invited them on the show. But you won't find people who make valid presentations on history because there's, there's no money in it and it's hard to do. And do you also, uh, I would also argue that because there is this politically correct approved history that there is not a, there's not this, people don't want to uh, uh, sort of be told that everything that they were taught uh, growing up or have, have learned recently is wrong. And so it mm. can be quite confronting to put this, uh, this real history in front of them. Yeah, that's, that's designed in purpose. The, the, I, the only place where I got history in the mainstream is through the school systems. And they were specifically designed to teach uh, a narrative. And a lot of the, uh, when I, when I did the only way you can undo that is by either listening to the people who actually studied history or doing self research, which is a very costly and timing procedure. Oh, well, it's made a lot easier now that um, there's the internet and obviously there's yeah people like you producing it. And this is another disagreement that I have with mainstream libertarians as they, oh, you know, we don't we don't want to talk about you know uh, historic historical events or have revisionist history that, you know, could trigger people. Yeah, it's a big mistake. There's so much power in history. I only picked it up recently when I changed direction on my YouTube channel. But I find it so powerful in a sense that a lot of what we talk about, our economic and theoretical philosophy theories, have already been practiced out in history in Europe and Russia. And I was surprised to find that a lot of the stuff we talk about have actually been played through and it correlates really well with the theory and a lot of people don't really reference that as much as they could which is a real shame especially in libertarian circles yeah that's definitely true now you've talked about one of your more recent videos which was exploring the the Jewish question and you have expressed your uh, support for um, white nationalism uh, why do you think that this is such a critical issue to explore, um, given how much controversy it creates? I think it's a critical issue be to explore exactly because it creates so much controversy. I, I find it surprising that it, it's created so much controversy just talking about white nationalism. 
Like I don't get a lot of emotional response when I talk about anarcho-capitalism or even say taxation is theft, but I let I get a lot of pushback from the left when I bring up the idea that white people deserve to have a national homeland if they really want it. I find the the backlash to that to be very confronting and confusing because this was European history since before the 60s, since like the dawn of period, dawn, dawn of time, civilization. Well, the reason why I think that um, it go, it, white nationalism, for example, goes a step too far is because I think the, the biggest threat that we face is cultural, and the biggest cultural threat or ideology is Islam, and I would rather, much rather focus focus all of our efforts uh, try, trying to fight that rather than, because I, I don't feel particularly threatened by, for example, like Asian and uh, Indian uh, migration. I mean, that, 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 that doesn't bother, uh, bother me that much. I don't, I, don't, I don't see what the problem is with race mixing. And so I'd rather focus on, you know, what, is, what are the big totalitarian ideas rather than, you know, get bogged down in sort of race theories. Well, I think race theory is, is important to specific people who care about their race and their cultural like ethnic identity. Um, I think I, I feel a lot more the push against where I live in Melbourne, the CBD. I definitely do feel like the minority here as a white person here because I'm constantly surrounded by Asians. And this was a big uh, political topic, I think, around 10 years ago. And the people that were arguing against Asian immigration were right in the sense that a lot of the white identity, particularly where I live, is non-existent anymore because um, the, the majority of people here are Asian. So a lot of people who want to identify with the whiteness and their ethnicity uh, see that as a problem. And it also solves the Muslim problem that you have because Muslim, Islam doesn't appeal to white people. It's more of a Christianity or even an atheist uh, community that white people embrace. So I think you can solve the Islamic problem by promoting a white ethno state as well. But I definitely support assimilation. I think that's important. But I do believe that, for example, yeah, a Asians and Indians, they have assimilated quite well. I mean, uh, f oh, most of them, especially the second generation, speak fluent English. They embrace you know, our culture and traditions. And so that's why I don't think the race itself matters. It's more how how people uh, fit into society. Yeah, that's fine. That's a, that's a very uh, Australian point of view to take, but a lot of white nationalists don't, wouldn't like accept that, basically. They just want a, a community full of white people. And I don't think that's immoral or racist to want that. I, I just think it's 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 not a threat that is that we that we should be worried about. I think that there there are more yeah like I said insidious things things going on. Like for example, like I, I live in Melbourne as well, and I know that Box Hill, for example, if you go there, it's pretty much like China, uh, Hong Kong or China Chinatown. It's yeah very Asian. But the thing is, like even though I've walked in those streets, I still don't feel threatened. Like, a, like it's, it's, it's still very, it's, it still feels very Western. I, I don't feel like I'm a stranger. Yeah, well, Asians are not violent people like other ethnic communities are. But a lot of people who grew up in Bucks Hill are traditional white families. And to see their suburb taken over by what they look like foreigners is, a, is a, distressing to them, which I find, which I empathize with and, and find an understanding like I do think it's a problem if they, you know, don't speak English and, and don't and don't associate with you. But I think that there has been, amongst the Asian and Indian people in Australia, there has been this integration that I think that you know it's like the I think the anxiety in the beginning, like say twenty or thirty years ago, was was reasonable. But over time, it's gotten it's. It's got it's gotten much better, and like I said, the the second second generation, like for example, if you talk to a second generation Asian and Indian on the phone, like you won't even know that they're Asian or Indian. You'll just think they're an Aussie. Yes, but that's still you're still ignoring the um, the white nationalist perspective. It, it, do you find it 
wrong that they want to be surrounded with white people? I, I, I don't think it's, it's really needed, uh, needed. like, I, I've, as long as they, you know, speak English and, you know, moderately integrate, I don't think what their race has got to do with it. Okay. Like, for, uh, like the, the reason, the reason why I don't think it like, cause like I said, the second generation, they pretty much fit in perfectly. But, uh, if you look at uh, Islamic migration into Australia, the second generation are actually worse. And like they're the ones who are committing all these uh, acts of terrorism or involved in terrorism planning. I mean, they're the, they're the people that we should be really worried about who they isolate themselves and don't speak English. Right, that's a regression to the mean. So you take a moral position that it's a, it's a threat to your safety, it's like crime and they don't assimilate. While as white nationalists, they, they don't, they don't associate with safety, they, they associate it with an aesthetic value that they want to protect their culture and their racial identity within their communities. I think it's fair to uh, protect culture, but I don't believe that that's always correct, uh, always connected with race. Well, not always, but I think it, it's significantly connected to race. Yeah. It's, yeah, like, like I said, I would rather, uh, as I said, focus on sort of the, the more pressing threats. But, yeah, it, it's been interesting to learn from you what is the, the white nationalist perspective, and I'm sure you've probably enjoyed discussing it with somebody, you know, who hasn't gone off at you. <laughs> well, even, like, from a libertarian perspective, if we are to create a society that, that, it, that adopts our libertarian social order, there's a greater chance of that happening in a predominantly white society than it would be in a multicultural society or a multi-ethnic society. Because the only um, ethnicity that ad adopts liberty and freedom has been Western societies and white people. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard this argument before that the Free State Project only works because it's, New Hampshire is uh, mainly a white state. Hmm. But for example, Singapore is like that's a very or well, economically libertarian country um, yes. in the middle of Asia. But it's not a, a culturally libertarian society. There's a lot of rules apply to people there. Well, yes, but it's in ter in terms of prosperity, uh, se as sense of community and culture. Like it, it's a lot of people. It, a lot of people. It, it's still a. A majority Asian ethno ethno state as well. Yes, but there's a lot of Western people who do business there or spend spend a lot of time there. Right. Well, it's certainly been uh, an interesting discussion. I'm glad. <laughs> I've I, I do like discussing. Like, obviously, I don't agree with you know, white nationalism, but, but it's good that we can discuss these in a, a civil and rational manner, which is actually so difficult to do uh, in this day and age. Uh, well, it depends who you talk to. You can't, you can't talk to, to anyone on the left about these issues, that's for sure. Yeah, I've been okay, haven't I? Yeah, you've been great. <laughs> well, that's all we've got time for for this show. So thank you, Adrian, for being a guest on today's show. Thanks, Tim, for inviting me. It's been fun. And so I'd like to advise all of our listeners to go and subscribe to Life, Love and Anarchy on YouTube and check out some of the videos that we discussed and you can make up your own mind about um, his arguments. Yes, sounds good. Thanks, Tim. And we wish you all the best with uh, the growth of your channel. It's nearly up to 10,000 10, subscribers, so keep up the good work. Thanks, so well. It's given me a lot of meaning. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll keep in touch in the future. All right. Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody. That's the show. So uh, the usual reminders at the end of the show, don't forget to subscribe to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Also consider supporting The Unshackled at theunshackled.net slash support. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep visiting theunshackled.net for all the latest news. So thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.